All right, mitaku ye oyasi, all my relatives. So among the Lakota people, we would greet. It's a simple expression that means all of my relatives, but what it's saying is that I'm related to things above, to things below, and to things all around. It's saying that I'm related to those who've gone before me, to those who are here, and to those who are not yet. So it sort of situates me within the bigger picture of creation. And among Lakota, we have this expression, ikche wichasha, which means common human person. And so in the, in the context of only God is great, Tongashila, grandfather, or Wakantanka, only God is great, and human beings at their best by comparison, we are unshika, we are pitiful. So it's a way of saying that God is great, and we as human beings uh, are a part of this creation, and we're put here to live in a good way, in a good way with the Creator, and a good way with other two-legged, other human beings, and then with all of creation. So it's great to be here with you at Gordon College, and thanks to Val and her kindness and, uh, and uh, invitation to come and hang out this week and uh, wrestle with some of these tough issues. For me, it's always been a challenge to try to figure out what does it mean to be a human being in relationship to following Jesus. Because at one point in time, I was led to believe I had to choose. I had to choose to be a follower of Christ or to be a native, but I couldn't be both. That's what the church told me. So we'll wrestle through some of that stuff today. So my father is an Oglala, Lakota Sioux, from the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. And my mother is a Sichangu Lakota Sioux from the Rosebud Sioux Reservation, also in South Dakota. But I do have a little... Uh, uh, French, Scottish, and English blood polluting, I mean coursing, <laughs> through my veins. So in the Lakota language, we would say I'm Ieska, or mixed blood. And that means I can play cowboys and Indians all by myself. <laughs> and um, unless I'm having a uniquely sort of a, a psychological episode, I almost always win. So my wife, Catherine, and I, we've been married for uh, 37 years, and uh, she is Welsh and Norwegian. So it's pre she's pretty much straight up white. <laughs> and I pastored an all-white church from 1982 to 1995. So I love white people. Uh, at least I love one white person, but, <laughs> but by and large, I think I love white people. I love all human beings, since all human beings are created in the likeness and the image of this one creator. So at one point in the history of the world, the creator said, let us create, let us reveal ourselves in humanly form. And creator revealed God's self in male man and female man. So female man is no less the mirror image of God as male man. And actually male man in his maleness is totally incapable of expressing the fullness of God's being in his maleness. It's only in male and female that we can ever hope to imagine who God is. When it comes to diversity, some have said that unity is only possible in the midst of diversity. Where there is no diversity, unity is impossible. Diversity is what makes unity possible. So if you, if you have if there's no diversity, then you have, you have a conformity or uniformity or a kind of homogenized blandness. So all of creation follows this, this idea that God exists within God's self as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. That's one of the foundational doctrines of the Christian tradition, this idea of Trinity, that God exists within God's self as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So before the beginning began, there was remarkable diversity expressed in the interrelationship between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we had radical diversity that was expressed in unity. So some would say that God is one because God is three. So when you look at creation in Genesis, everything begins in diversity. So when the earth is pregnant with life in Genesis chapter 1, that the womb of the earth is, is now nine months pregnant with life, and when Creator wants to create animals, He speaks to the earth, and He says to the earth, bring forth, yield. And so out of the womb of the earth come zebras and giraffes and, and beavers and cows and buffalo and cats and dogs, etc. Diversity. And then when God wants to create plants, 
He says to the womb of the earth, bring forth. So the earth produces, yields, peach trees and palm trees and date trees and plum trees and pomegranate trees and all kinds of diversity. So from the very beginning, when God expresses God's self in creation, it follows the pattern that exists before the beginning began, which is radical diversity expressed in remarkable community. And then if one reads the Bible all the way to the end, then we see that the whole thing ends the way it begins with every tribe, every tongue, every nation gathered together around the throne. So the meta narrative of the gospel story is radical community expressed in diversity. So when we're talking about colorblind this week, that's really what we're talking about. So diversity is not a social, po political uh, idea that we bat around. It's really a theological issue. So now for me, in 1972, I was a part of the takeover of the Bureau of Indian Affairs office building in Washington, D.C. So 600 of us went to Washington, D.C. to protest the federal government's breaking of almost 700 treaties. So for eight days, we occupied the Bureau of Indian Affairs office building, surrounded by federal marshals and riot police uh, with tear gas and dogs. At one point, I had an egg carton with gas-filled light bulbs, and we were going to burn the building down. So we did over $2 million worth of damage to that building. During that time, I began to hate white people, hate Christianity, because of all the ills that had taken place because of the coming of these missionaries to our reservations who were, who were a part of the whole colonial enterprise. So our people learned Christianity in a very colonial, Eurocentric framework. So I hated white people. I, I ended up in jail in Washington after that. I ended up in Maui, Hawaii, hanging out with all these hippies. Now, back in the 70s, all the hippies wanted to be Indians because we were cool. So I would, I would hang out with all of these hippies, and there was a part of Maui called the Seven Sacred Pools where psilocybin mushrooms grew in abundance every morning. So we would go there and eat mushrooms, and we were all high on psychedelics. I'd say to the hippies, when horn of buffalo point to full moon, beaver know he cannot fly. <laughs> then the hippies would go, far out, man. Oh, dude, that is like so deep. So I could have like, I could have like had been a shaman, had my whole crew. But then I was sort of lost at the same time, and I knew there was a God. I knew there was a creator. I looked into Lakota ways, and I'd grown up in a Catholic uh, background, but my Catholic friends used to steal the wine and steal the communion wafers and steal the money out of the offering plate, so that was like the depth of my Christian experience. But it was the Catholics who ran the boarding schools on our reservations, and, and if we had time, I have a couple of slides that we won't get to today. Uh, because there was a period in U.S. history where Indian children were forcibly removed from their homes by federal law and sent to boarding schools. And it was a part of the whole assimilationist policy of the United States, but it was founded around the premise of a former military man named Captain Pratt, whose philosophy was to kill the Indian and save the man. So these kids would be sent to these industrial boarding schools like in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And, and at one point, there were 450 schools in the United States. So my mom, my dad were sent to these boarding schools. All of my aunties and uncles went to these boarding schools. So during those years in the boarding school, they were taught another language, another culture, and they were forced into accepting another religion, Christianity. So imagine in these militarized boarding schools with, with uniforms and being marched in and regimented in, and their mouths washed out with soap for speaking their language, beating, this took place, tons of sexual abuse and violence took place, but these were six and seven-year-old little innocent boys and girls who were sent off to these schools for 12 years of their life, sometimes not returning back home for 12 years. And that was going on in the early part of this century. And I don't speak my language today, though all my mom and and dad and all my aunties and uncles did because they wanted to protect us from the racism and prejudice they experienced, so they only taught us English. So imagine, that was their introduction to the good news, was those boarding schools. So now here I am in Maui and having this experience. I'm uh, all alone on a beach, so we've been eating these mushrooms, me and my hippie friends, and I end up like one in the morning all alone on this beach, and I'm flipping out. I'm going to die. I'm having a heart attack. I'm going crazy. I'm really having this horrific paranoia episode. And so I tried my Lakota prayers, and I was reading the, and I tried my Hindu prayers because I was reading a lot of Middle East stuff. And then um, I tried a couple of Hail Marys, but that didn't work. 
But I remember what these two dudes said. Now, these guys picked me up hitchhiking a couple months earlier, and they witnessed to me. Nobody had ever witnessed to me before. So they told me about Jesus and sin and salvation and all that kind of stuff. But I thought they were just like narrow-minded, self-righteous, little white boy Bible thumpers. So I stopped the car, made them stop, and I cussed them out, and I made them let me out because I wanted nothing to do with their white man's religion because I know how that crap works in our reservations, and I don't want nothing to do with that. But here I am all alone on this beach, and I'm flipping out. So none of my prayers are working. And then this little thought came to my mind. One thing those boys said, that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So I didn't know what else to do. So I literally yelled as loud as I could. And I beat, Jesus, if you're real, and you can do what those guys said, would you forgive me? Would you come into my life? When I prayed that prayer, the, the, the effect of the psychedelics immediately evaporated. The fear and the paranoia uh, just vanished. And I experienced what the Bible talks about, peace that can't be humanly comprehended. And so that's where I became a follower of the Jesus way in 1974. And even though Jesus looked an awful lot like Captain Jack Sparrow at the time, <clears throat> I'm pretty sure it was Jesus or the Bible. You know, after I prayed that prayer, I thought I heard, Welcome to the kingdom, matey. <clears throat> so I just said, Aye, Captain. And off we went. No, I didn't say that. So then I, I ended up going to this Christian hippie commune in Wasilla, Alaska. And we could see Russia from our commune uh, in, in Wasilla there. So during that time, I was led to believe uh, a, a whole other thing about what it means to be a human being. So I found out that after I became a follower of Jesus, now I had to become a Christian. And that was different. Because becoming a Christian, I had these crazy choices. Now I had to choose whether I wanted to become a Calvinist, a hyper-Calvinist, a neo-Calvinist, or whether I wanted to be Arminian, or whether I wanted to be dispensationalist, or whether I wanted to become Calvinist, and then, or, or Covenantalist. And then I had to decide whether I wanted to become a Presbyterian, or a Nazarene, or a Baptist, or a Pentecostal, uh, and then I had to decide what book I wanted to read. Do I want to read the New American Standard, the Revised Standard Version, the NIV, the Message, the Weymouth? So I got all these options that began to complicate the simple reality that I'd experienced of following Jesus. Now, to complicate things, I said well, to this leader in the church, what do I do about my native culture now that I'm a Christian? So he said, let's see what the Bible says. So he opens up to the end of Galatians, the third chapter, there's neither Jew nor Greek, bond or free, male or female, for we're all one in Christ. So he says, therefore, Richard, don't worry about, being, about your native culture anymore. Just be like us. So if I was any wittier at the time, I would have said, right on, honky. But I wasn't. So I learned that God loved me, but he didn't like me. He loved me enough to let his son hang on a tree but he didn't like my native dancing, my native ceremonies, my native eagle feathers, my native powwows, my native drums, my native regalia, because all of our Indian stuff was born in shamanism or demonic activity or the occult or witchcraft. But white culture was like religiously neutral. But Indian culture was of the devil. So then I was led to believe I had to make these choices, be a Christian or be a native, but you can't be both. So for me, this whole Christian experience has been one of colonization. And all Christianity, as I learned it, this American evangelicalism, wanted to colonize my soul and make me something that I'm not. Where Jesus came to help me become all that he created me to be in the context of being Lakota uh, and being this human being, this Ikche Wichasha. So all over the world, we have been wrestling with decolonizing ourselves and finding this freedom that, that we see Jesus saying to those who would be his followers, he came to give them life and life in abundance. Now, another thing they told me the Bible said is that when you come to, to Christ, that you become a new creation, all things pass away and all things become white. And that was my experience. So now, this whole journey. So let me show you this short video clip. Now, around the world, indigenous uh, folks have been digging themselves out of colonization, finding our own freedom and, and sovereignty as individual people, whether the Maori of New Zealand. So in this video clip, you're going to see Maori people from New Zealand, uh, people from Irian Jaya, uh, Taiwan, the Moluccan Islands, North America, all indigenous people who are expressing 
their faith in Jesus in very indigenous ways. And this is a brand new phenomena that we're just beginning to do. So this took place in Jerusalem a couple of years ago. Uh, and you'll see uh, people doing it. So this is a movement of young people today who are finding their way into the, these things that Creator has made possible. So this is my uh, young son, Daniel, uh, who's dancing with me here. So let's watch this short piece here. Wakatanka et kia Mawani hiru hei heira hiru hei heiro Heyo hai hai dei Wani kie kichi Mawani hiru hei heira hiru hei heiro Heyo hai hai dei he can hear the drums calling him home The mountains mourning their sons Five hundred years or so The men are singing memories of the land The sound of dancing comes A symphony That echoes of the sun Here's La Corte, here's home Visual poetry Man of honor, man of worth, pride and dignity. Let all creation lift up one voice as it was meant to be. Together, the creator's masterpiece. She beckons a new dawn She sees the stars that lit the path Her forefather sailed upon With trembling hands her voice bursts forth with life Breathing a new song, a symphony That echoes off the sun She is Maori, she is home, visual poetry
So this whole, this whole story, it begins in a native community. This little Indian community called Bethlehem. And the scripture says that the word of God became flesh and blood, and the message version says that he moved into the neighborhood. Whose hood did God move into? This little Indian village, <clears throat> among a tribe of people, a tribal nation called the Hebrew nation, and a sub-tribe called the tribe of Judah. So God chose to reveal God's self in humanly form in this native boy, born in this village, among a tribe of people. So this Jesus had black hair, black eyes, and very dark skin as an aboriginal, indigenous, native, First Nations boy. He grew up and he spoke the language of his people. He followed the, the customs of his tribe and of his nation. When the time came for him to enter into public service, he goes to the wilderness. There's a medicine man out there wearing camel uh, fur and eating locusts and wild honey. And this medicine man, John the Baptizer, says, this is the one I've been telling you about. So when Jesus comes out of the Jordan River after being baptized, this phenomenon happens where the Creator, like a dove, descends upon Jesus. And a voice from heaven says, this is my beloved Indian boy, my native boy in whom my heart is deeply pleased. So it's a paraphrase, right? So God says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And who is the son? This black-haired, black-eyed, dark-complected, aboriginal boy. So when Jesus comes out of the water, he's not ashamed of his ethnicity. He's not ashamed of his skin color, his hair, his eyes, his tribal background, because he, released, he receives the affirmation of the Father's love within the cultural context of his human being as an indigenous boy, Jesus. And when Jesus comes out of the water, there's no sense of embarrassment or shame on the part of the Father about his ethnic boy. So the whole of this gospel story begins in an indigenous village called Bethlehem among a tribe of people, the tribe of Judah, and the story spreads around the world. And God loves stories so much that God created human beings. And God chooses to reveal God's self in story, in all of our stories. And so this week, Beyond Colorblind, you have an opportunity to be story, tell story, learn story. It's a profound opportunity to go to some deep places with one another to begin to learn what does it mean to be fully human and to be a fully a follower of Jesus. I have my Bible in my pocket right here. Actually, I want to close with two things. One is a quote from my favorite poet, Hafez, a 13th century Persian poet. Hafez writes, everyone is God speaking. Why not be polite and listen to him? So everyone is God speaking. Why not be polite and listen to him or her? So I'm closing with this song. I like to stand. I'm going to sing it as, a, as an honor song. So when we sing honor songs in our community, we stand. So I'm honoring Creator by singing this song of thanksgiving. Aha wado, aha, why can't I do? Hey, oh, hey, yo, hey, oh, hey, Yahweh, Yahweh, Naya. Way oh hey oh hey, he away 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 nigh. Way oh hey oh hey, ha ha wado ha ha. Why can't I do hey oh hey, yo hey oh hey, Yahweh away nigh. Way a ho, hey, oh, hey. He away, 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 nigh. Way a ho, hey, oh, hey, oh. How me talk to you? Oh, yeah, see.